Next slide. Will the universe continue to expand forever or collapse back on itself? The fate of the universe depends on the expansion speed and the amount of gravity in the universe. Remember that gravity is a curvature of space-time. If the expansion is slow enough and the gravity is strong enough, the universe has a positive curvature and will eventually collapse back on itself. Time has a beginning and an end. If the expansion is fast enough and the gravity too weak, the universe has a negative curvature and will expand forever. The boundary case between these two is the flat universe. The flat universe is one that has the critical density, or boundary case density, between the closed universe with a density greater than the critical density, and the open universe with a density less than the critical density. The universe's curvature, and therefore its fate, was determined at the start of the expansion. To find how much gravity there is in the entire universe, we look at the density of a representative part of the universe. The total mass of the universe will be the density multiplied by the total volume. So we hope we can determine what size scale is sufficient to encompass a representative sample of the universe, and we hope we can determine all the mass in that representative part to calculate the density. Here are the three possibilities again. A closed universe has positive curvature and is finite in size and, and time, but has no edge. Its density is greater than the critical density, and it's like a four-dimensional sphere. An open universe has negative curvature and is infinite in size and time. Its density is less than the critical density and is like a four-dimensional saddle. The flat universe is the boundary case between the open and closed and will stop it expanding after an infinite amount of time, so it's effectively a special case of an open universe. Its density is equal to the critical density and is like a four-dimensional sheet. To determine the density of the universe, determine its curvature, we need to inventory all of the matter out there. Our cosmic inventory of all the stuff we can see and our measurements of the primordial deuterium both say that the visible matter is 15 to 20 times too little mass to close the universe. What about the dark matter? Next slide. This slide is about the various independent pieces of evidence for that strange stuff we call dark matter. The rotation curve plot we looked at in the Milky Way lecture tells us about the total mass within a given orbit, both the regular visible matter and the dark matter. The visible matter doesn't add up to enough gravity to make the stars and gas move as fast, acceleration, as they do in the spiral galaxies. Similar sort of thing is seen when we look at the motions of the stars and gas in elliptical galaxies. The stars are accelerating much more than what can be explained from the visible matter's gravity, and the visible matter's gravity wouldn't be enough to keep the gas shells around all of the billions of galaxies. When we look at the motions of galaxies in hot gas inside galaxy clusters, their motions are much too large to be explained by the visible matter alone. There is a lot of material between us and the quasars. Gravitational lensing of the light from distant galaxies and quasars by closer galaxies, or galaxy clusters, enables us to calculate the amount of mass in the closer galaxy, or galaxy cluster, from the amount of bending of the light. The derived mass is greater than the amount of mass in the visible matter. Inventorying all of the ordinary matter in the lensing galaxy clusters those that lens the light from distant galaxies, and comparing it to the total mass of the galaxy clusters gives a 5 to 1 ratio of dark matter to ordinary matter. The collision of the galaxy cluster, 1E0657-56, called the bullet cluster, with another galaxy cluster has produced a clear separation of the ordinary matter from the dark matter. The ordinary matter of one cluster is slowed by a drag force as it interacts with the gas, ordinary matter, of the other cluster. The dark matter is not slowed by the impact because it responds only to gravity and is not affected by gas pressure. In the picture below, the ordinary matter is colored pink. It is hot gas imaged by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. The blue areas are where most of the mass in the cluster is found the dark matter. The dark matter locations were determined by gravitational lensing of light from background galaxies. 
Another galaxy collision called MAX J0025.4-1222 shows the same sort of separation of dark matter from ordinary matter. By the way, the list of numbers in the names of these clusters tells us their right ascension declination coordinates on the sky. Current tallies of the total mass of the universe, visible and dark matter, indicate that there is only 32% of the matter needed to halt the expansion. We live in an open universe. Ordinary matter amounts to almost 5%, and dark matter makes up the other 27%. Next slide. An independent way to measure the overall geometry of the universe is to look at the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation. If the universe is open, saddle-shaped, then lines starting out parallel will diverge, bend away from each other. This will make distant objects look smaller than they would otherwise, so the ripples in the ba microwave background will appear largest on the half-degree scale. If the universe is flat, then lines starting out parallel will remain parallel. The ripples in the microwave background will appear largest on the one-degree scale. If the universe is closed, the lines starting out parallel will eventually converge toward each other and meet. This focusing effect will make distant objects look larger than they would otherwise, so the ripples in the microwave background will appear largest on scales larger than one degree. The resolution of the COBE satellite was about seven degrees, not good enough to definitively measure the angular sizes of the fluctuations. After COBE, Higher resolution instruments were put up in high altitude balloons and high mountains to observe the ripples in small patches of the sky. Those experiments indicated a flat geometry for the universe, to within 0.4% uncertainty. Cosmologists using the high resolution of the WMAP satellite to look at the distribution of sizes of the ripples confirmed that conclusion using its all-sky map of the microwave background at a resolution over 30 times better than COBE. WMAP also gave a much improved measurement of the ripples. The distribution of the ripples peaks at the one degree scale. The universe is flat. This was confirmed more recently by the Planck satellite with 2.5 times better resolution than WMAP. The fact that the amount of matter in the universe, regular and dark, is not enough to make the universe flat tells us that there must be an extra form of energy at work to make the overall geometry flat. Also, measurements of the universe's expansion rate over many billions of years have shown that the expansion rate has accelerated in the past several billion years, again pointing to an extra form of energy. For the lack of anything better to call it, we call it dark energy. I talk about current research of this dark energy in the last part of the cosmology chapter in the textbook. The fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background also tell us that the dark matter is different from ordinary matter, and that there's about five times as much dark matter as regular, visible matter. The slide ends with the two big questions in astronomy today. What makes up dark matter? What makes up dark energy?